Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Brianne Roth. I am the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Nantucket Historical Association, and I want to thank you all for coming out to our second Food for Thought of the fall. Um, before we get things started, if everyone could please take a moment to make sure your cell phones are on silent so we do not disrupt this afternoon's talk. I would like to say that the Food for Thought lecture series is um, made possible in part by MS Worthington Foundation and that media sponsorship is generously provided by Novation Media. Today's talk features Mary Longacre. Longacre is not a native of Nantucket, but descended from Tristram Coffin on her mother's side and from a five generation summer family on her father's side. So it's not a surprise she inherited a love of the island and its history. Mary attended Academy Hill and Cyrus Pierce schools for some parts of her childhood and moved to the island year round in 1986. She worked at the Old Mill as a teenager and as an adult developed a career in accounting on the island, eventually starting her own consulting business and moving to Alexandria, Virginia in 2000. Mary served on the town's tree advisory committee um, and the NP and EDC strategic planning work group in the 90s. She was a founding member and the first director of the Nantucket Community Garden, which celebrated its 25th anniversary. Mary moved back to the island year round in 2015. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mary Longacre. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, so, after that introduction, you might say that as the co-founder of the Community Garden and a uh, multi-generational descendant of Nantucketers, I have deep roots on the island. That's, that's why I get to start off with a joke, which I think was Jim's <laughs> advice. Um, I'm going to uh, show you uh, Spunky, my 1957 American La France fire engine. And uh, I have a little video here. Fortunately, I couldn't bring the fire engine today. I would have loved to do that. Um, but that's quite an undertaking. So the important point here is that it's running. The engine is going. Uh, this is just a walk around that I did to uh, you know, have something to show people, like my family, who didn't believe that I bought a fire engine. Um, as I said, this is a 1957. It was purchased by the town new and served for about 25 years here on the island. Uh, served first in the station across the street on South Water Street and then out in Sconset uh, for the last few years of its life. And uh, it's not a great shot right there. We'll, we'll get there around to the sunshine again. Um, but you can see it's in pretty good shape. And that was part of why I wanted to purchase it. Um, this was something that served the island. And I just felt that you know, it should continue to be here. It wasn't too far gone. Uh, but as you'll hear, uh, it was quite a challenge to get it back in this kind of shape. So that's about the end of that. OK. And let me go to the slideshow. So I have a number of pictures here, some historical pictures, some from the NHA, uh, some from other people who have given them to me. And if you have any pictures of this fire engine uh, from its time and service, I would love to get copies just for my records. Uh, these slides are going to advance automatically. They're not going to be coordinated to the talk. Um, and let me get that running for you. OK. Um, so. Uh, People want to know, how did I end up with this fire engine? I am not a firefighter. Nobody in my family was a firefighter. I had no love of fire engines growing up, although I did like classic cars. Um, I had no ambition to own a fire engine or interest in owning a fire engine. Uh, OK, that's, hang on. I know what that's going on there. Sorry, I got an autoplay on the video. I'm gonna... Sorry. There we go. All right, let's try that again. Um, and so how did I find out about this? How did it get to the point in its life where it was available? Um, we'll have to go back a couple years. In Labor Day weekend of 2015, I had some friends visiting me. They had never been to Nantucket before. And we got onto the subject of the take it or leave it and the thrift shops and the yard sales. I can't imagine how we got onto that subject, but just about every piece of furniture in my home is secondhand, so maybe that had something to do with it. Um, and so they asked me, well, does Nantucket have Craigslist? I thought, well, I don't know. I, I never bothered to look and see if there's a Nantucket section in Craigslist. So I, I thought about it for a few days. I thought, well, let me go to Craigslist and just type in Nantucket. We'll see what happens. And a list of about 150 things popped up. There isn't a Nantucket section, but there's a Cape and Island section. 
And I thought, well, let me see what's on the list. You know, just curiosity. I'm a very curious person, generally. And I was scrolling through the list, and there's Nantucket baskets and rentals and, you know, all the things you'd imagine you'd find. And then this thing pops up that says Nantucket fire engine. And I thought, well, that's got to be some kind of reproduction joke, knockoff. Somebody stuck Nantucket on it just to make it sound more interesting. Couldn't be a Nantucket fire engine. So I clicked on it. And it was a Nantucket fire engine. And it said, can't believe they let it go. And I was like, what? I can't believe they let it go either. This is a real Nantucket fire engine? And he said, in great condition. I thought, well, this is an advertisement on the internet. You know, we don't know about that great condition part. Um, and uh, it said, you know, don't call me if you're just curious. I was like, oh. <laughs> But I am very curious. Yeah. And so I thought about it for a couple of days. And I, I, I made some calls. And, um, and I said, I'm going to call the guy. You know, I, I just, I got to know, you know. And so I called him, and I said, you know, tell me about it. And he told me that, how he ended up with it. And, um, and I thought, well, I should, you know, go see it. Um, and, and I did go and see it. And um, it wasn't quite in great condition, but it was in pretty good condition for being 60 years old and, you know, a discarded piece of fire equipment. Um, so I, I talked to a bunch of people. I talked to the NHA about it, obviously. And they had some very good advice. They said, well, we don't have any money for it. We don't have anywhere to put it or display it. And, you know, there are already fire engines. We already have an old fire hose cart house. And, you know, I don't know what we'd do with another one. And I thought, well, I can't blame them for that. That's very rational take on things. Um, so, so where did this fire engine come from? Uh, it was, as I said, purchased by the town. It was retired in, uh, I think it was the uh, early 90s. And uh, the town prevailed upon Flint Rennie, who had purchased Nantucket's 1927 fire engine back in the 60s, and said, why don't you buy this one too? And Flint, being the great guy that he did, said, sure. And so he plunked down $500, and he bought this 1957 fire engine from the town. And he had a little work done and, and you know, got it back in tip-top shape. You know, after 25 or so years, it needed a little bit more maintenance than the town wanted to invest in. Um, and so for a long time, Flint Ranny owned two fire engines, and he brought them both to the Daffodil Parade, and um, that participated in the Fourth of July wire, water fights. Um, and he was a wonderful custodian. But in the early 2000s, the 1957 fire engine broke down. The water pump on it seized. And um, you know, at that point, it's you know, almost 50 years old. And you couldn't get parts. American La France went out of business after a while. They had been one of the premier manufacturers in the US of fire engines since the 1800s. And unfortunately, they're no longer in existence as a company. But um, you know, they, they weren't ready to give up on it. They, they put it in the garage and said, you know, we'll, we'll keep looking and see if we can find a water pump for it someday. And over the years, they, they did keep looking on and off. And I, this is my imagination. I can only imagine that at some point after a dozen or so years of the fire engine sitting not running in their garage, they said, you know, we've got another fire engine and it does run. And maybe it's time to let this one go, the one that doesn't run. And on Nantucket, you know, having a garage is a wonderful thing. Having a garage occupied by a fire engine is, uh, that doesn't run is not such a wonderful thing. Um, and so they made the effort. They um, started shopping it around. So anybody interested in taking on this project? Um, it, they, Rob told me they asked for a couple of years. He did all his industry contacts that he knew from you know, being the owner of an antique fire engine. Uh, everybody he could think of, nobody was really interested because it doesn't run. And we haven't been able to figure out where to get the parts that we're going to need to get it to run. So eventually they heard about a guy on the Cape, or a guy on the Cape heard about it. And he said, well, I know a guy in a museum in Ohio, and he probably would be interested in this fire engine. So um, the Rannies dragged the fire engine out, um, sent it off island to the guy in the Cape. Whatever that deal was never happened. So now the guy in the Cape has our Nantucket fire engine, and he's doing the same thing. He's calling everybody he can find you know, in, the, in the industry. Um, apparently, there's not a big market for antique fire engines. Um, there are a lot of people interested in them, but again, you need the money, you need the space, and you need the expertise to get these things running. Um, and then what do you do with it? <laughs> You've got an antique fire engine, great. Um, now what? Yeah. So he was unsuccessful, and he was the one who had put the ad on Craigslist. His name was Bill Manley. Uh, and so I stumbled across this ad, and as I said, I talked to a number of people on the island. Everybody said, somebody ought to do something. 
you know, and, and after I purchased it, I ran into more people who said, yeah, I saw that ad and I thought about it, but you know, I didn't buy it. And eventually I realized I was going to have to be somebody. If this fire engine was going to avoid being scrapped, uh, Bill was planning on, plan on selling the property where he was keeping it. He was contemplating sending it to the scrapyard. And I said, when I went to go see it, great condition is a bit of a stretch. It's advertising lingo. But it really wasn't that bad. You know, it wasn't falling apart, rusting. Um, it was in pretty good shape. So um, I, I went and I saw it, and it, literally, it was love at first sight. As I said, I've always been a classic car aficionado. But my promise to myself was I would never buy a classic car until I had a garage to keep it in. Well, that had to go out the window now <laughs> in a big way. So I, I wrote, built a check for the fire engine. It was not a very big check to purchase the fire engine. I said there's no market for them. There's no real resale value, especially when they don't run. Uh, there are a few people who like to take on projects. Um, and I'm not a mechanic. I couldn't take on the project. So I wrote Bill a check, and I came back to Nantucket, and I said, OK, now what? I now own an antique fire engine that's sitting on the Cape in somebody's yard, and I have to figure out what to do with it. Um, so I talked to uh, people who had been involved in the restoration of Nantucket's 1937 fire engine, which is out in Wisconsin. It's owned by the Nantucket uh, Firefighters Association, I think is the right name. Um, they had gone through the community foundation and gotten some money to get that engine restored. Uh, and just to give you an idea of that, that was over $160,000. Uh, but they gave me the name of the guy that did the restoration. It was Firefly Restoration up in Maine. And so I called them up, and they said, well, we really only do the body work. We don't do the mechanical. And my, of course, my issue was mechanical, and I wasn't about to spend $150,000 on the body. Um, I said, but we have subs that we work with. So they gave me the name of a uh, rescue equipment dealer in Massachusetts that they worked with. And I called them up. And they said, we don't work on anything that young. And I thought, 1957 is young? Well, I guess in the world of antique fire engines, yes, it is. There's a much more interest in the older style, the, the sort of chitty chitty bang bang style is the way I think of it, um, not so much in these. And so I thought, well, do you know anybody? And they said, well, we have a firm that does our brake work in Rhode Island. Let me give you their number. I said, OK. So I called the firm in Rhode Island. And they said, yes, we worked on a fire engine like this a few years ago. We'd be happy to work on yours. Uh, OK, great. You know, first step. I know where the fire engine is going, and I know who's going to work on it. This is good news. Um, so I caught up Cape Way Towing, and I said, can you tow my fire engine? By the way, it's 27 feet long, and it's 12,000 pounds, and it doesn't run. And they were like, no problem. We got it. We'll put it on a trailer. Um, and one of the really interesting things, I didn't bring that video with me, but um, Bill Manley had done some work on the fire engine, a little bit of tinkering. And he got it so that it would roll. Well, rolling is really good, because that means you can just push it, and it'll move. Uh, and so I got to see it roll down the hill and towards the tow truck, which was really fun. That was a big thrill for me when I actually saw it moving. Um, and so we got it loaded up on the tow truck. We sent it to Pascal's Service Center in Rhode Island. Um, they got it in October of 2015, and they had it for the next five months. And if you can imagine the repair bill, it started at 22 pages, and that was just the first bill. So they went through it. One of the slides is, will be up here is their description, just the start of it saying the things that they had to do. And this was backwards. That was missing and upside down. And it was leaking this way and that way. And I had a, one goal for them. I said, I need it to be running, and I need it to be safe and reliable. Because again, I have no experience with a fire engine. And if I bring it back to Nantucket and it breaks down, I do not want to have to haul it back off the island and send it to Rhode Island again. So I wanted them to do as much as they could to make this a safe and reliable vehicle. And so after they got it, uh, they did some research. They have a parts store as well as a heavy equipment repair shop. And so they have a lot of connections. And they found an original 1957 vintage water pump still in the box, had never been opened. And that was the missing piece. So hallelujah. Um, I didn't ask how much. <laughs> and uh, so they got that, and, and they, they said they could get it running. And they did a lot of work on it, and they did a lot more work on it. So this is all fantastic news. And I think, OK, I'm going to be in the Daffodil Parade in 2016. They have it over the winter of 2015, 2016. So I register for the parade. And that was kind of my whole goal. The reason I bought this fire engine, I thought that it should be part of the community. It had served for 25 years. It was not ready for the scrap heap. I didn't want it to go to some collector who knows where in the country 
or a museum when it was still such a capable piece of equipment. Um, I had seen the Nobska disappear. I had seen the Nashon disappear. I'd seen one of the light ships get converted into a luxury rental. And I just didn't feel like that should be happening if it didn't have to. Um, so Pascal's was working on it. I was registered for the Daffodil Parade. Um, I told them, okay, I need it by the end of March. That gave me a month's wiggle room before the parade. At this point, I had never driven a fire engine. Let's just you know, admit that right up front. Um, I talked to the Registry of Motor Vehicles. They said, you don't need a CDL license or a commercial license. If you don't have passengers, you can drive this fire engine with a regular license. And I said, you're kidding. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> um, and I also talked to uh, Snip Eldridge, who is a Nantucket firefighter. And uh, he remembered serving with this fire engine, beginning of his career, end of the fire engine's career. So he was familiar with the fire engine. I was like, yeah, that's fantastic. He actually found the original manual for this fire engine still at the fire department. And he gave it to me, and I sent it to Pascal's and said, here you go, here's the Bible, you know, here's what you need. Electrical wiring diagram, you know, all the parts and everything. Um, I thought I was going to read the whole thing, but it's pretty intimidating. Um, things like, you know, when you start the engine, pull the choke out and return the choke to its normal operating position. I don't know what the normal operating position for a choke on a 1957 fire engine is, but apparently back then they did. So, yeah. Um, let me try it. That. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so Pascal's is working on it, and they call me in March, and they say, it's ready. You can come get it. I was like, all right, we're, we're going for it. So I had SNP lined up. I had Rob Benchley lined up, who was one of the call firefighters in Sconset. And the plan was that we were going to drive to Pascal's. SNP was going to drive the fire engine back. I was going to sit in the seat and learn how to drive the fire engine while SNP was driving it. And Rob was going to drive the car back with us as backup. Uh, so we get to Pascal's, and uh, the fire engine runs around the block. We do a test drive. Um, you know, we take pictures. We have a wonderful time. We thank the people at Pascal's profusely. And um, Rob and Snip get in the cab, and they're going to go down the street to the gas station to fill it with gas. And they get less than the block away, and the engine dies. And we cannot get it restarted. So Pascal's comes back out, and they tow it back to them, and they say, okay, well, we'll figure out what the problem is. There was an electrical issue with the fuel pump that it had not been discovered previously. These things happen. Okay. Uh, so they needed to keep it for a while longer. And now that I had seen the fire engine, I was like, and here's a couple more things you can do for me while you have it. Uh, and I was like, okay, you know, I've got a month. This is why I planned it this way. I knew that, you know, the first time might not be the charm. Um, however... In anticipation of the fire engine coming back to Nantucket, I had called the police department, the fire department, the Nantucket Hotel, the Steamship Authority, the Inquirer and Mirror, uh, and Bruce Holgate, who owns Hammy Hurd's old fire engine, and I had arranged a parade to welcome this fire engine back to the island in March. And so on the way back in my car, we called the police department and the fire department and the steamship authority and the inquiry and mayor and the Nantucket Hotel and Bruce Holgate and said, I'm sorry, there's not going to be a parade. We broke down. We're not going to make it. Um, and, you know, that, uh, unfortunately, was that. So we did not have a big parade to welcome the fire engine back. And I was, you know, disappointed, as you can imagine, uh, but I was not surprised. It's an antique car. Things happen. There's a lot that could have gone wrong. Something did. I was thankful that it went wrong at Pascal's and not anywhere on the highway in between. <laughs> um, so I make a new boat reservation for um, mid-April, Pascal's has the fire engine ready. They fixed that issue. They did a couple other things for me. Uh, this time, SNP was not available. And uh, having seen the fire engine, I was like, you know, I'm, I, I did get a driving lesson from the mechanic at Pascal's. Um, and essentially, what I saw was that driving this fire engine will work out. It's manual steering. It's a double clutch system. So you're driving down the road, and you're doing this on the manual steering, and you're doing this with your feet to do the clutch and the shifting and everything. And I thought, holy smokes, you know, what am I up for? But, uh, so SNP wasn't available. Um, I wasn't ready to drive, so I called Cape Way Towing again. Okay, you guys uh, go get the fire engine in Pawtucket. I'll meet you in Hyannis. Uh, in the meantime, we need an inspection, because Pawtucket being in Rhode Island, they can't do a mass inspection. So we stopped at Rod's truck stop first. Well, so we have the boat reservation. I go over on the fast ferry and, and meet the fire engine. We're all set. Rod's truck shop says the fire engine is not going to pass inspection. <laughs> um, there were a couple little things, but the big thing was that the fuel tank was leaking. 
apparently, they, they had done some work on the fuel tank to patch it up, but they'd never filled it all the way. It's a 30-gallon fuel tank. You're not going to put that much gas in a, a vehicle that's sitting in the shop. Well, when they filled it, I requested that they fill it before they gave it to me, because I didn't want to pay Nantucket prices for 30 gallons. Um, so when they, they filled it, we, we discovered there's a leak at the very top of the fuel tank. And so not only was it not going to pass inspection, but the steamship authority would not let me on the boat with a leaking fuel tank. So I called Cape Duty Towing, and I said, would you take this back to Rhode Island today for me, please? <laughs> and they did. Um, and I think that was about April 19th, and Daffodil Weekend was coming up like April 30th in 2016. Um, and Cape Way sa Towing said, well, we'll call the subcontractor who did the fuel tank for us, uh, and they'll fix it, and you will have it back in time for Daffodil Weekend. So I said, oh, I, I can live with that. That's okay. You know, third time's a charm now. Um, and so I called the Steamship Authority thinking, how on earth am I getting in a boat reservation? It's April 19th, and Daffodil Weekend is coming up. And would you believe, when I talked to them, they said, five minutes ago, somebody canceled. And we have a reservation at noon on Thursday, I guess that would be the 28th, if the Daffodil Weekend was the 30th, um, and we can put your fire engine on. I was like, that sounds really good to me. Um, so things are going on. I'm in constant touch with Pascal's. They're, you know, they're telling me, we're going to be ready, we're going to be ready. Um, and everything's looking good. So on Wednesday the 27th at 5 p.m., I get an email from Pascal's that says, we're sorry, the fuel, the fuel tank exploded. Nobody was hurt, and the fire engine is fine, because they had removed the fuel tank from the fire engine in order to do the welding. But apparently, when they took the gas out, there was just enough left that when they were doing the welding on the fuel tank, something caught, and it exploded. And at that point, I, I just, you know, I was crying. You know, everything that I had worked so hard for since the previous September, um, my, my goal in my mind was to make it into the Daffodil Parade. And to me, that was the ultimate expression of being able to restore this fire engine and bring it back to the community. And that now was not going to happen. Um, so you can imagine, or maybe you can't, <laughs> how disappointed and, and just, you know, heartbroken I was at that point. Um, so they said, you know, we'll, we'll have the guy make a new fuel tank for you, uh, no charge, and um, we'll, we'll let you know when it's going to be ready. And I said, well, you know, you've got as much time as you need because you can't get it done in a day, and that's all the time I've got. Um, so I went down to the Steamship Authority, and I said, I need to cancel my reservation. And they said, well, you know, we don't give refunds on truck reservations without a good reason or without a, 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 an extraordinary reason. I said, the fuel tank exploded. They said, that qualifies. Here's your refund. <laughs> Um, so that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so then, you know, I had to wait and hear from Pascal's, and it was June uh, by the time they said it was all done. Um, and so I made the reservation for June. I had Cape Boy Towing go and pick up the fire engine again. And uh, they met me in Hyannis. Uh, and again, I take the fast ferry over to meet the boat, and uh, I guess the fast ferry gets in around 11-ish or 10th or something like that, you know, late morning. And I had a noon reservation to come over. And um, I call Cape Way Towing, and yep, he's on his way. And um, wouldn't you know, the inspection station on Route 6 was open that morning. And they had to go in, you know, they're, you know, they're big vehicles. So they go in, they stop for the inspection. They pull up to the boat at about 11.40, and the boat loads at, uh, uh, comes in at 11.30 and starts loading at 11.45. But if you're not there by 11.30, you lose your reservation. And because I couldn't tell them that I was, they were going to be there by 11.30, all I could say was they're on their way, you know, the inspection station, Route 6, the traffic, you know. Um, so I lost the space. <laughs> so I thought, well, the fire engine is here. It's running. I'm here. I'm going to stay here until I get on the boat. And that's what I did. <laughs> so I sat in the cab of the fire. So the 245 boat comes and goes, and a couple of standbys are in front of me, and they get on. Um, and uh, forgive me if I have my times mixed up, but I think there was like a 4 o'clock freight boat, and that goes, and I don't get on that. And eventually, I do get on, I think they took pity on me, uh, the 8 o'clock boat. Um, and uh, so I get the fire engine started up, and, and they're like, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I'm like, I've only had one driving lesson on this. You know, I can't really hurry. Uh, it's a 12,000-pound vehicle with manual steering. And, and they're like, we'll drive it on for you. And I'm like, that would be fine. <laughs> So, so they drive it on for me, and we are this tight, 
to, it's on the Eagle, so we're this tight to the edge, and I can't even get out of the fire engine at that point, which I have been sitting in for the last eight hours. And I'm like, you know what, that's okay, <laughs> I'll just stay here. <laughs> so we, we come over, and I was actually kind of happy to be on the eight o'clock boat. That meant I got into Nantucket at you know, 10, 15 at night, the streets are empty, um, and I can drive the fire engine without having to worry about traffic and pedestrians and anybody seeing me. And, you know, <laughs> and so I, I did make it, I did find a garage space back in June of 2015, uh, 2016. Uh, a wonderful space for it, uh, really nice landlords. Uh, unfortunately, that only lasted a year, and so in June of 2017, I lost the space. That's why there are flyers on the chairs. I'm still looking for a space for this fire engine. Um, but, you know, all's well that ends well. I did get the fire engine. Um, I did learn how to drive it. Uh, I did bring it back to the community. It is running. Uh, we uh, appeared at the Wisconsin Civic Association's meeting um, last summer, or summer of 2016, to honor the retiring on-call firefighters. I was very happy to be there for that. And um, we also appeared at the Island Fair in September last year, and I had the kids climbing all over it, and that just filled me with joy. It was so wonderful. You see a couple of pictures of the kids coming up there at some point. Um, it was really a wonderful experience overall. And this year, I was in the Daffodil Parade. And so that was great. <laughs> Okay, well, I went a lot faster than I thought I would. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, this, this is a really interesting uh, experience that I've had. But one of the takeaways that I've had from this experience was that the 20th century is part of our history. And we're not doing a lot as a community to preserve it. I know the NHA is involved in some efforts to try and figure out what's important about the 20th century. But I recently finished reading this book, uh, Sheep, Moors, and Sea by Alice Carey Williams, and that's available in the Athenaeum after I return it this afternoon. Um, it's a really neat book. It's about her experiences growing up. It's, it's fiction. It's not uh, uh, her actual recounting. And I'm sure it's romanticized, and I'm sure she consolidated a lot of the characters into uh, one person, uh, because otherwise the, some of the people in there are quite remarkable. Um, but it's a really interesting read. It's about Nantucket around 1900. And when you stop and you think about everything that has changed on Nantucket, things that have come and gone, as I mentioned, the Nobsk and the Nashon and the light ships, uh, but so much more, um, all of those things are part of our history too. This fire engine was part of our history. I'm not saying we have to save every single fire engine that ever served here, um, or every single everything. But we really need to stop and think as a community, what is important to us for the 20th century? How do we build a museum uh, to share that history and that evolution that Nantucket has had with the people that are here. Uh, in particular, because our population has grown so much over the last couple of decades. And while you know, they are uh, welcome in the community and have contributed to the community, they don't necessarily have the connection to the history of the community that so many of us do, uh, having grown up here or having had uh, generations growing up here. Uh, so that, I think, is really important to, to reflect on and to preserve. And that was a big part of why I bought the fire engine. Um, oh, there we are in the touch of truck at the Island Fair. And then you see the kids climbing on it. And then you'll see two pictures coming up. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, so um, any questions, any comments? Um, anybody want to examine me to see if the psychiatrist... I have a microphone if me? anyone has a question. I can come over to you. Questions? Oh my gosh, he's dumb. <laughs> Anything? Okay. Anyone? No? Okay. Um, well, uh, let's give a huge round of applause to Mary. A huge thank you. Thank you. And um, Mary has her business cards here and at the front desk if you'd like to talk to her more, have any other information, want any more information on her project. Um, we will be back here next week um, with Sarah Boyce from the Linda Loring um, Nature Foundation. Um, so we hope to see you back here next week. And thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you.